I did a 21 day crossing one of the last things with the motors running the whole time. That's how much fuel I could carry. Yeah. That's so good. It, it was the craziest, it was the craziest setup and I could do maximum of 14 knots forward and then basically a maximum of 12 knots backwards. It was like, yeah. So catching Marlin out of the sailboat was no problem at all. And how did it start out? Like what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? Okay. <laughs> Because if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit, as yeah. far as if I can remember uh -huh. correctly. Hey, everybody. It's Anthony Pino from Blood Money and Hook Optics, and this is the State of Sport Fishing podcast with me, Anthony, and uh, Nick Carullo, who is... Uh, catching marlins in the dr today so we won't be hearing from him but we have a uh, hugo mclean born in new zealand now resides in hawaii um hugo thanks for joining us man yeah thanks for having me man tell us a little bit about yourself just chatting before the pod ab about you know your adventures just tell us all where it started and then we'll, we'll get to the the craziness with the sailboat <laughs> yeah um so i was born and raised in new zealand did a bunch of travel when i was younger and stuff normal stuff with the family and then uh, got into fishing quite late, like sport fishing quite late and uh, just got super, super addicted. It was actually by accident out uh, fishing for kingfish. Marlin came and ate my live bait. And uh, and after that, I literally went into the tackle store the next day and bought like everything I needed to go marlin fishing. And uh, I was just fishing out of like a you know 25 foot skiff um, in New Zealand. That's what most people use over there. So it's a little element aluminum box and uh kind of five years later i decided to go on this journey with the with the sailboat and go explore some offshore spots in different countries and then yeah bought the boat the sailboat in cairns <laughs> in australia um had to do a bunch of work to it it was not run down but it wasn't in the condition that i wanted it to be in and uh so we spent like almost two months i think sitting in marlin marina in cairns which is like 40 degrees celsius non-stop with no ac it was terrible but uh yeah i did that and then fished the reef for i got like six weeks of fishing in at the reef and then decided to move on like just right before the end of the season i went down started heading south um and prepared preparing myself and some friends for the crossing to uh the south pacific island gotcha did you ever and make it, it back to new zealand with it the, uh, originally I not guess until the very no not not until the very end i, I got I super i mean when i said i was about to say i got super close but i mean the closest i got was probably 250 miles away i got you and uh that was when yeah we went on our way across to new caledonia from uh from we left from gold coast in australia mm -hmm. so across to, on my way across to new cal we stopped at uh, a little place called Norfolk Island. Norfolk Island just happens to be 180 miles from the Wanganella Bank. Um, yeah. Which is like the, whole, yes. the holy grail of striped marlin fishing. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, and so I got to fish there. We actually did the first, on our way there, we stopped and did like a day and a half and caught, can't remember exactly. I, I want to say it was like 23 in a day and a half. Um on lures and then uh we went up to norfolk and couldn't leave to go to Newcal. so we had a weather window and we literally did a day trip back down to the wanganellas gotcha. with uh, some guys from the island that's uh, and, tell, uh tell, tell us more about that place i mean i know we got a, a lot of places we gotta cover but man i've seen a lot of videos on youtube about the wanganella banks and it just looks i mean the size of the straight marlins i mean there's 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 other places in the world you know mag bay and, and the galapagos and ecuador that have numbers of striped marlins but not like not like there's blue marlin striped marlins that you that they have there i mean they're they're not right. small I, no well that's the thing like i we've done trips there so i've I've, like, I've been lucky a friend of mine in new zealand had a had a big boat like a 70 footer that we did a bunch of trips on before i did, took my own boat there and uh man i mean our best day our very best day was 28 like sun up to sundown and that's all like an average size of 300 pounds with striped marlin and i think we may have even caught one blue marlin that i can't remember there's, there's not that many blue marlin there you're lucky to get like one or two a trip yeah and the trip's normally like four or five days 
<clears throat> what uh what makes that so special it's just some sea mountains in the middle of nowhere it's the weirdest thing it's not even like a proper mountain it's just like a big mud bank huh. and it's covered it's covered in like that black coral apparently i mean we've never been down and had a look it comes up to like what does it go to like it's like 35 meters i think the shallowest we've found oh wow which is a, yeah just over 100 foot i think yep um or just under but uh it's the weirdest thing yeah it's not it's not crazy underwater mountain it's literally just a mud bank and uh for whatever reason the striped marlin are there in like crazy crazy numbers and in size there's a lot of bait there though right that's why they're there it's, well it's the weirdest like some trips we don't see any bait other trips you see like these big giant meatballs of what's called red bait and yeah. uh and it literally is like brown in the water you can see it from so far away and wow. uh and you pull up to it and you pull up to it in 20 or 30 giant striped marlin smashing it up <laughs> nice that's that's crazy now how like um how do you guys uh like you hook a 200 you hook two or three 200 striped marlins i mean they don't come typically by themselves so how does that work with the uh so that was the with craziest the thing with that oh with the sailboat it was easy because yeah. it was it was just like driving well it's actually in my opinion easier than a normal game boat because the, the motors are so far apart so I give you a quick rundown on the, on the sailboat because I yeah, didn't yeah. do that at the start. It was a Lagoon 410, so like a production sail catamaran. The guy that had it before me ripped out the original motors, put in bigger motors, shaft drive, pellers, and uh, and normal like trannies and stuff like that for a for what would be in a sport fishing boat and uh, big fuel tanks. I could basically run the motors and I did a 21 day crossing, one of the last things with the motors running the whole time. That's how much fuel I can carry. Yeah. That's so good. It, it was the craziest, it was the craziest setup and I could do maximum of 14 knots forward and then basically a maximum of 12 knots backwards. It was like, yeah. So catching Marlin out of the sailboat was no problem at all. The interesting one was when we first started going to the Wanganellas was, and it was a giant 70 foot single screw X commercial boat. I've seen those and videos. That's kind of where we live. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on, it was called destiny. Um, and yeah, we would fight it off the bow and Neil would just kind of idle around at three, four knots and we'd chase, pick one and chase it down and then leader it and you drag it down the side of the boat, de-hook it or, cut, or pull it off at the back of the boat there. But uh, in terms of the sailboat, man, it was so much fun to drive. A few of my friends who drive sport fishing boats have driven it and they were like, this is the dream. Like if you had to catch a real and get after a real big one, yeah. that was the boat. Because wow. there's no trans, there's no transom in the water. You're just pushing these tiny little pod yeah. at the back of the boat, and you could, yeah, maneuver so easily, go backwards at twelve knot. Uh, it was the craziest thing. So yeah, two or three at a time wasn't wasn't a problem. Badass. And then why had why do you like? I guess having the sailboat gives you the the opportunity to make long crossings for very little little money and over like, overhead and, and fuel. I guess you know on my boat. Yeah. How big was the cross the crossing from? Gold Coast to New Caledonia? Uh, well, we did. I mean, we did a, a bunch of stops on the way. We actually right. went to place. Yeah, we did. Went to like two different islands on the way and yeah. did the Wong and Ellis as well. So, I mean, the longest crossing I did was 3,200 miles in one go Jesus. without stopping. Wow. And that was that was right at the end of the trip. And that was because of COVID. Nothing was open. I couldn't stop anywhere. We just had yeah. to go. And it was Hawaii to Fiji. But uh, the average crossing I did, I did was like probably five to 700 miles. Yeah. And, and I mean, I could run the motors the whole time. I, I wasn't, I'd never sailed a boat before I bought this thing. So I, got you. I wasn't like super, I wasn't super into sailing, but it allowed me to do those extended distance super easily and fast as well. Yeah. And for a sailboat. Yes. So, um, but like, yeah, the crossing from Gold Coast to New Cal, we did that over like six weeks because we stopped at a bunch of different islands and oh, gotcha. Gotcha. had fun on the way. It was kind of like, that was like the very first trip and we went, we got pretty crazy on some of the islands and did all sorts of weird stuff. So lots of drinking. And now when you like, when you go to a place, like, do you actually, you, you obviously probably fish in between, but do you actually go fish the areas that you like stay for a couple weeks or, or months or something like that? Yeah, definitely. Like that boat, cause your cruising speed is eight and a half knots. So I just mm -hmm. fished everywhere. Every, yeah, yeah. every time I was moving, there was a line in the water, whether it was a Rapala for some Wahoos or Onos or, or like some mackerels, or if I was open water, I would have marlin lures out. Um, but yeah, once I got to a destination, I would like 
either try and talk to some of the locals, look at the charts and figure out, you know, where I would fish. And, and yeah, it's not that hard to figure out where the fish are going to be if you can spend a couple of days at it. And uh, I had pretty good fishing in most most places. One of my favorite, well, one of the best spots I had for fishing was Vanuatu out of Havana Harbour. Mm-hmm. You would have seen there's a, there's a boat there called Nambus. Russ Hughesby's the captain and owner. And uh, he was super helpful, set me up with all the details and all of that. And we had some really good days out of there. And it was like, you could see the anchorage from where you're fishing. Yeah. And we caught a big one in Vanuatu as well. Yeah. A real big one, like uh, eight, 850 plus, six, six hours it took us. <laughs> oh, crazy. <laughs> I had a girl, I had a girl on the rod and uh, stand up five and a half hours of it. And then her boyfriend took over right at the end. But yeah, that was a hell, hell fight, that one. That's awesome. So, so you do like when you go there and you fish, and then you just kind of did you have it all planned out in your head where you were going, or you just kind of let figured it out? Um, I did, like- and then I did have a route planned. So, my all time goal was to get the boat to Ascension Island mm-hmm. um, and just stay there until I caught one that I could weigh. And uh, I, I got a British passport as well as my New Zealand passport, so I'm allowed to live there if I wanted to. Uh, um, so that was the goal was just to go there and stay there. But uh, I got a little carried away in the south going east too far. And I was meant to go Vanuatu up through the Solomons and through Indonesia and across to Africa and then round the bottom and across to Ascension. But uh, I ended up all the way over in Tonga fishing Blue Marlin again up in Vivao. And, and then I had a real shit day out fishing it was super rough. Most of those Pacific islands, you're fishing in like 15 to 25 knots every day. Trade really? winds. Gotcha. Yeah. Unless it's like, I mean, Vanuatu, where I was fishing out of Port Havana, could, uh, you could hide from it, but you're like right on the upper side of the ledge. And if you wanted to push out a little bit, you, uh, you had to fish in the rough. And, but it literally blows 15 to 20 most of the time down there in the South Pacific. Wow. Just standard trade winds. And so, yeah, one day in Tonga, it was like 25 knots. We actually, we did catch and uh, I'm coming back in the, in the harbor there. And uh, I said to the boys, I was like, who wants to come to Hawaii with, with me? I was like looking at how far it was on my maps when I was up there, up top, up top driving. And I was like, who wants to come to Hawaii with me? Two of them put their hand up and was like, yeah, we'll come. I was like, okay, well, we're going in three days. I looked at the weather and it looked like a good weather opportunity. I had to go to Samoa first. Samoa was like 400 miles north of Tonga. And then uh, I stopped in, in Samoa and then waited for an opportunity. It's... <laughs> It's funny when you, I talk about it, like, you, oh yeah, let's go to Hawaii, but you have to stop in Samoa and then another stop, like north of Samoa is a place called Christmas Island, which was one of the coolest places I went on the whole trip. Um, tiny little island, highest point on the island is like 10 feet above sea level. <laughs> and uh, it's like a crazy, crazy uh, little sand structure in the middle, like reef sand structure in the middle of the ocean. And it's like, one of the top destinations for catching bonefish on the fly on the flat giant flats there sand flats but uh i was only supposed to stop there for like three days ended up staying for six weeks because it was so much fun and then did another crossing from there 1250 miles or something up to kona hawaii which was one of the greatest feelings ever pulling into hanukkah harbor yeah gotcha that's pretty that's a i mean that's huge crossings now when you look at the weather like what what do you, what is a weather window to you like i mean um no, it's like so, anything less than a hurricane kind of and you and like the big thing if you're in a sailboat is the wind direction because uh-huh. you can have lots of wind that's fine if it's behind you mm-hmm. or like on your you know your aft quarters but uh the an ideal weather window is quite hard to get especially going from Samoa to or tonga to hawaii because of the trade winds it doesn't yeah. ease up really the only time you get light winds um through the, uh, the doldrums and I got super lucky. I had about six hours of doldrums and then a storm came through Gotcha. and that was probably the scariest, the scariest weather I had on the whole entire trip. Yeah. With that storm after the, after, on the way to Hawaii. After, yeah. Yeah. It was just me and me, my dad and my friend Jesse on board. And, uh, it went from oily calm to like 65 knots in about five minutes. Jesus. How long did that last? About five hours. So I, I went side on and actually tried to turn into it a little bit um, for like the first, just to try and get up on it. Obviously with a storm, if it's coming towards you, if you can go against it, you're going to yeah, yeah. pass it quicker. Yeah. So I would try and like turn up into it as much as I could. And then it just got too much and I had to turn down sea and just kind of like idle down sea for a couple of hours um, to ride it out. And I'm assuming you're like 
this is like definitely in the middle of the crossing. Like there's nobody coming yeah. to get you. No, yeah. like if, if, if we got into trouble, the US Navy would have to come from Oahu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a that was a fun one for sure. And that was like, I never thought, oh, we're going to sink. But it was definitely like, okay, well, we need to have everything ready to go in case something bad did happen, you know? Yeah. And uh, and I, mean, I, I had all, all, all the good safety equipment on the boat. I never felt like I was in danger the whole time. Yeah, but it's... I mean, you're constantly in danger with this, that, those sort of crossings, you know, like, I mean, you just kind of kind of live like that because yeah, I mean, your your version of uncomfortable and dangerous is probably a little bit different than, than somebody who takes their boat from, from Maryland to Florida every year, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, definitely, definitely. So it's like, yeah. It's, yeah, I was, I was never scared of those big crossings. Like I'd done a little bit of, I did a big crossing. Uh, I'd done all the Wong and Alice stuff, Neil on Destiny. And then um, I actually did a big crossing from Singapore to Roger Ampat with Jimmy Brown, captain of Haruko. Mm-hmm. Transported a boat with him from Singapore to Roger Ampat, which was like 12 days or something. And then other than that, I hadn't done anything. I'd never done a big crossing as, as a captain. Yeah. And so, but I always felt extremely prepared. I was never in a rush. Um, which was a, which is a massive thing for doing those big crossings is you can't rush them. You just got to rush small crossings, <laughs> you know, yeah. you'll, you'll get yourself in a couple 200 milers or even hundred miles. Or you you can get yourself yeah. in trouble doing that. Like for sure. That's uh, something to think about for everybody. Like you can't just say, Hey, we're going to, I need, I need the boat to be here by this date. And if you, yeah, like, that's, I mean, that's great that's if you run into trouble. If you have a couple months to deal with it or a couple weeks to deal with it, if, depending on how how long the crossing is. But like, if you're like, oh man, let's just go do this right now and through the weather, you're going to end up some serious yeah. trouble. A bad yeah. spot for sure. <laughs> so, all right. So you're, what was the uh, kingdom of Tonga like? I mean, they, I've heard stories about good, place, good fishing there. Yeah, that place is so awesome. On our way in, to Tonga from uh, come from we came from Fiji the north in uh, north uh, Savu Savu in Fiji just like way up north and uh, we got there and on our way in like we're just probably sixty miles out from like a six hundred mile crossing and uh, hooked like a seven hundred fifty pounder and I'm like man we're in fucking paradise let's go <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ended up pulling that thing off like just before we got the lead like the swivel was coming out the water and pulled the hooks so i was like so upset about that because i was going to take it in and weigh it um you know i always tried to turn up to some of those islands with with fish and if you turned up with a 700 pound blue marlin the locals are going to be stoked for sure yeah so um uh but yeah tonga was fun the only problem for me with tonga was uh it was long runs to get to the fishing grounds okay and again i'm in a sailboat the fastest i can go is I mean, I'm cruising at eight and a half knots. So I had a lot of early mornings and late nights. Yeah. And then uh, what, I don't know why. Define, but, define a long run. <laughs> like, uh, oh. Well, for, for the Pacific, yeah. It's a, a little different yeah. to East Coast fishing. Like a long run is, is like 35 miles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that takes uh, obviously half, half the day. Yeah, so I would I was leaving like way before sun up and then getting back right before sundown and and uh but we still had some good fishing there man it's it's an incredible fishery a lot of the days we were catching three four marlin and uh lots of like the cool thing about those those pacific islands is you literally never know what you're going to catch um i got a, a bunch of slams down there you know stripies blues blacks yeah. whatever say lots of sailfish lots of lots of turds but they're big ones as well. That's what it is kind of cool about them. They're, they're big down there. Wow. So yeah, I would have caught like a couple of a couple of sales that I reckon would be. I'm I'm trying to convert it into from kilos, but like you know, like 70, 80 kilo sailfish. Yeah, it's almost two hundred pounds, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah, like giants. It's enormous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did a bunch of looking around in Tonga. One day we were trolling um, open water, two thousand fathoms deep, and uh, we were actually traveling to another island and i'm like sitting in my home chair looking out the back watching the lures and then all of a sudden i can see the bottom and uh <laughs> i was like, like holy shit pulled the boat out of gear slammed it in reverse like went right open reverse to stop me and uh yeah I turned around and there's this giant unmarked reef that's like probably like half a mile by half a mile and uh it just came out of nowhere not on the charts or anything luckily it only came up to about 25 feet 30 feet deep Ooh, yeah and uh yeah we ended up fish stopped and like did some gt fishing there um and uh and one of my buddies jumped in and did some spear fishing off the ledge for some dog tooth and that's like one of the greatest things about those places down there is you can 
literally decide what species of fish you're going to catch and it's all pretty close yeah that's amazing how far was that from anywhere like that's got to be uh, un- like unmarked on the f- chart f- 15 miles wow from that's, dry land that's like i mean to find something that's not marked on a chart in this day and age is pretty incredible yeah you know, pretty badass um, there was a bunch of that around tonga i learned my lesson there um and uh, i started using like satellite imagery for around the islands rather than the charts like navionics or whatever because mm-hmm. the satellite photo doesn't lie yeah and uh so i i would when i was navigating reefs and stuff i would pretty much purely use satellite imagery um and uh and you can just avoid bombies and reefs and stuff like that just just from the satellite imagery gotcha. that was huge <clears throat> that was huge for there but the people were awesome in tonga fishing was great the weather was terrible uh yeah there's so much to see there and i hardly even scratched the surface you know yeah we had some good good times you know you pull up to resorts and one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me on that sailboat well not one of the craziest but one of the funniest pull up to this remote island go to anchor and you're in like i'm in tonga in the middle of nowhere i've been sailing for like four or five months hadn't seen a single female or attractive female (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in months and uh we pull up to this resort and there's like 12 chicks all sunbathing on the beach and we're like we're there's four of four lads on the boat and we're like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> we pull up go up to the bar and we had this deal with this this one resort we'd been going there a couple of days and we had this deal with them like we would sell them fish for bar tab yeah and uh so we just caught like a big yellowfin that day 70 80 kilo yellowfin and uh, we took it up to them and they were giving us $11 a kilo. So we got like almost a thousand dollars worth of bar tab. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we just ordered a bunch, like I got 16 cocktails off the bat and I was like, <laughs> yeah, 12, 12 for the girls and four for us. And uh, the girls, long story short, they ended up, they were there shooting for some bikini company from Australia and uh, ended up taking them out on the boat. It was like their second day there. <laughs> ended up taking them out on the boat all week, taking them to like beaches, like cave diving and beach fires and stuff like that. They had the best time ever. That's awesome. And the owner of the bikini company was like, this is what she's like, I do this every year. This is the best one we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, dude. But yeah, lots of random stories like that, meeting cool people everywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, when you go to some of those places that, you can only get to by boat or super yacht, you mm-hmm. know, like or helicopter or seaplane or whatever. You run into some really interesting people. Um, met, uh, like briefly met Kissa Sins, the porn star. She was at one of the <laughs> island resorts. <Exactly. laughs> yeah, just lots of random people like that that go and do the whole remote thing. Gotcha. Pretty yeah. wild. Tong- and- Tonga as a whole was fun. Yeah. And then you eventually made it to Hawaii after all that. Yeah. So pull into pull into Kona um when was it November November 2019 so right before COVID and uh man that was one of the best feelings because I'd been like I'd been there before and fished and uh I fished with BT um when I'd been before on uh it was Marlin Magic back then Mm -hmm. and uh so it was a dream for me to like get there on my own boat or have a boat there started fishing straight away caught a bunch of Marlins and met like so many good people up there and then fast forward through to whenever COVID started the whole world shut down and unfortunately I was stuck in Kona. So yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good, actually pretty good spot to be stuck. Yeah. At the sure. whole, it was unreal. Like I don't think it'll ever happen ever again in anyone's lifetime where you have the whole Kona coast to yourself. Like, cause all of the commercial boats got their, um, their permits taken away from them. They weren't allowed to leave the Harbor unless it was private fishing. Wow. So, so, and because the boat was my house, I was allowed to be on it and I was allowed to go out fishing. And uh, man, we had some of the best times. It was, it did make it a little more difficult because you didn't know, um, you know, what the bite was doing or whatever, if you mm-hmm. missed a couple of days, but it wasn't hard to find them in Kona. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's freaking wild. That's probably, uh, did, what was it like in Kona? Because the place is like, I, I would assume most of Hawaii is kind of depended on a fair amount of tourist income like was it tough for the people there yeah extremely tough for a lot of the tourist tourist operations i guess i mean everyone survived the in terms of businesses and stuff um well i never heard of any of the boats like going under you know? yeah um but uh it was in my opinion it was so nice having been there when it's like full-on tourist and then yeah. going there when it 
was completely closed down. You could walk Ali'i Drive, which is like the main street along the waterfront. You could mm-hmm. walk that at seven o'clock at night and not see a single person. Wow. Normally, normally there's like two or 3,000 people walking around, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I was lucky. I got to meet so many good people there that I'm still like, I'm at one of the person's houses right now that I met here in Hawaii during COVID. Gotcha. And then, so fish there for a bunch of time. And then in the end, my um, so when you tr- check into certain countries and stuff, on a traveling boat on like an internationally flagged boat you get you personally get a visa and then uh the boat also kind of gets a temporary import visa i guess Mm -hmm. um and that only lasted for a year in hawaii so i was getting close to the end of my year i applied for an extension they denied it because i was a sailboat and it wasn't unreasonable for me to sail (laughs) somewhere um my original plan was to go to the Marshall Islands. I'd heard like really good things about fishing, Blue Marlin fishing down there in the Marshall Islands. Um, but nothing was open. Ended up getting accepted to go to Fiji by their government and uh, got a crew together, like six of us total down to, that was when we did the big crossing, 21 days at sea with six of us, three guys, three girls. It was wild. Yeah, We had, we had pretty good weather the whole way. And again, so one of the other things I forgot to mention, that whole trip that I did all the way from Australia up to um, up to Hawaii, I'm going against the trade winds. So like yeah. typically people go east to west and I was going west to east. And so that's why I had to be really picky with the weather going up there. Um, and then coming down, it was like so nice. Tailwinds the whole time and then get to the doldrums. We had like three days of doldrums, which was a dream. Um, and then, yeah, get down into across the equator and uh, – down into the south pacific we got some nice weather as well but i mean it was windy but on the right angle you know yeah yeah now do you when you do these crossings do you say just sail at all or are you just under power most of the time it depends like a couple of times uh so the boat's extremely efficient to run under under motor completely uh at eight and a half knots it would burn like a gallon an hour each side so like two gallons total wow and then uh if you do motor sailing with a good wind you can literally get that like it takes all the load off the motors and uh-huh. you down to like half a gallon a side oh wow yeah. yeah that's and that's where you get like the massive range from you know there's the motor sailing so um yeah we did a lot of motor sailing on that on that crossing i mean most most crossings i tried to motor sail if i could or if uh if i was going to be somewhere that i was like crossing a random sea mountain or something i'd pull the sails down just in case we hook a nice one yeah, yeah um otherwise yeah it was just motor sailing just to get that range and you get a little bit more speed from it you know i've always but, wondered uh, i've always wondered like you know I've followed some people on social media that take their boats not not really fishermen but people that pull a lure you know here or there or something like that that do similar similar stuff to what you're you're doing and i've always wondered like these people that when they catch a marlin like do they are they under under power or have they ever caught it under under sail because i was in mag bay a couple of years ago and we were there was a we met the boat in mag bay and then we went down to fish the potato bank and there was i don't know probably two dozen sailboats out docked up in the bay too and like a day and a half later we saw them down to the south where we were fishing and they fished right through all the boats catching catching stripies <laughs> and i was wondering like and they were all sailing. They had a tailwind. Life was good for them. I was like, man, if, I wonder how effective they could be, like not make with the without the boat making the noise that it does. I feel like it has a lot to yeah. do do with because I've been I've had so many times where I'm like making a move or I'm running to start the day and I set out. My guys are really good at setting out and getting everything basically as soon as we set out or slow down, everything's set out right. And mm-hmm. it's amazing how often like the first bait in the water gets crushed and you're like, Whoa. Yeah. Like, was yeah. he, I mean, he must've been there for, you know, the whole time since we stopped. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They, I've, I mean, I've had that uh, happen a bunch as well, you know, first, I mean, actually the two biggest fish I caught on the whole trip uh, was a black marlin in, in Cairns, which we call like nine fifty plus. plus. Um, that was one lure in the water, just sitting the, you know, long rigger before we put a bait out and uh, we were in, 60 meters of water or something like right just coming onto linden bank there and um yeah thing eight and i was like holy fuck yeah <laughs> i hadn't seen i'd never seen a fish that big before you know i'd caught a bunch of striped marlin some like 500 pound blue marlin and i was like oh my god and it was crazy because one lure in the water my, my buddy was literally hand, like hanging the, the second lure in the water yeah. and he just lift, lifted it back in the boat and i started going backwards straight away <laughs> and we got the leader we like i fished wind-ons 
and uh, we had the wind on on before um, my buddy had even got into his harness or anything. Yeah. And it was like right there at the back of the boat, just gave it a little tug and then it took off. <laughs> yeah. I'd be curious but, uh, to see like how that would work with the, you know, if you were just, if you were in like a really good place like Mag Bay or, you know, the yeah. Wanganellas where, you know, you could actually like literally sail and fish at the same time and then motor up back up sea and then sail and see how many, uh, see how many less you would more or less you would catch with, with, when making it's, noise versus not making noise, you know? Yeah. On that crossing that we did from Hawaii to Fiji, we had like the most insane straight line fishing I'd ever seen, you know, for a crossing. Call like 14 blue marlin, a black marlin, a couple of stripes, bunch of sailfish and stuff like that. But literally all just doing a straight line. But the biggest fish of the whole trip, like a 500 pound, 550 pound blue marlin, we slowed down because we were doing some cooking or something. I turned the motors off to slow us right down. Under sail, doing like three and a half knots or something. And the lures are literally just like kind of wallowing in the water, not even popping or anything. And we yeah. caught a 500 pounder. Wow. So oh, that's interesting. I guess when you're that, when you're close enough, it don't matter. Yeah. What, what, make, what noise you're making or what, what, <coughs> what noise you're not making. Yeah. And I mean, my, if you think about like a 110 horsepower motor versus a 1250 horsepower motor or, you know, mm-hmm. 2600 MTU or something like that, my motor's not making much noise in comparison. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, and it never seemed to affect me versus the other boats I was fishing around. I fished in Tonga even, I was fishing around 270, 80 footers and regularly catching more than them. Wow. <laughs> so, Interesting. Yeah, but uh, everyone has their day though. They, they they definitely got me a few days as well. Yeah, it happens. Everybody's going to have their day. You just got to spend yeah. enough days out there to have a good day. Yeah, for sure. So then, so you went from, and you went straight to New Zealand from, from Hawaii because you couldn't stop. No, stop. Stopped in Ed. Fiji. And, okay, yeah, yeah. And so that was 3,200 miles we did to Fiji. And then how many days was that? 21. Oh my God. Yeah. You have you a, you're, you're a patient dude, man. <laughs> I mean, it was three guys and three girls, and we yeah. had like a stupid amount of alcohol. <laughs> and uh, we just literally kind of one one night we actually got we crossed the equator and it coincided with one of the girls' birthdays, and we got so obliterated. <laughs> that I was like, none of us can drive the boat right now. Let's just shut the boat off and <laughs> and go to sleep. Let's be hours. honest, you, you weren't driving the boat to begin with. <laughs> you were out there in the middle of the ocean, put that thing in autopilot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, someone's got to be on watch. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that was one of the funny nights. We like just literally turned the boat off, went dead in the water, and slept for like seven, eight hours. Nice. Yeah, that's... but uh, yeah, we got to Fiji and then um stayed there for a bit and then i ran into the issue of COVID again i couldn't take my american crew that i had on the boat into new zealand like our government was super strict on letting people in so my old man flew up to fiji and did like two weeks in quarantine in a hotel and then me and him sailed the boat down to new zealand like it was like seven or eight weeks later after we arrived in fiji yeah and that's where uh that's where the trip finished in new zealand i put the boat i did a bunch of fishing over over summer there i got there for summer and then um i got offered to ride along for the hawaiian summer on snafu with brian gotcha. and um and so i was basically like do i sell the boat or do i just put it on the hard and leave it in storage and i just ended up putting it in storage and um and flew back to hawaii and like literally within i don't know 12 hours of landing in hawaii i was fishing on catch and blue marlin with brian Gotcha. Interesting. Right. What's fishing with Brian like? Because I don't know. I you know everybody sees what he posts on social media and those incredible underwater videos. Like you know, yeah, he, he definitely gets bites, and uh, I don't know. Definitely one of the, if he was definitely one of the first boats to have a sonar there in Hawaii. In right? Hawaii, yeah. yeah, I think so. I can't I can't remember if he was the first or not. But yeah, on the that was on the old Kazan. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, fishing with Brian's fun. You know, we have a good time. Like. You know, obviously catching fish is number one priority, but you've got to be having fun as well on that boat. You can't, yeah. it's not, it's not a boring boat to fish on. Um, and Bra- Brandon, the, the first mate there, an absolute legend as well. Um, Brandon Wilder, gotcha. he's, me, and him, me and him get on real well. We've done a bunch, a little bit of travel together now. So, and then, uh, yeah, sold my boat, ended up selling my boat uh, this year, actually. It sat on the, sat on the storage for like nine months or something and had a, had a family offer me some money. And I was like, just take it <laughs> before I change my mind. Yeah. So uh, I was, yeah, down in Costa. I actually went down to Costa Rica in, last year and spent a bit of time there fishing with the Grand Slam guys. Gotcha. Pretty, pretty 
tightly run operation there. Yeah, man, those that, that's another like super cool operation. Um, the owner was a charter of ours in, in uh, Hawaii when we were fishing on the Kazan. And um, he invited uh, he invited me down. I was I had to go down and reset my US visa, right? So I was going there anyway. He invited me down and uh, ended up doing a bunch of fishing with them. They were super good to me and still are. Um, I literally just left and uh, saw them all like three weeks ago from Costa Rica. Um, but uh, yeah, they've, they've been super good to me as well. Gotcha. But such a such a cool boat that Paul man. Yeah, really nice boat. Incredible boat. But yeah, that, that, their whole crew is super cool. And I had a great time with them. And uh, I'll be seeing them again in, in Mag Bay. They're going to be in the same marina. Uh, sorry, in, in Cabo, not Mag Bay. In Cabo, yeah, they're, they're going to be in the same marina yeah. as us. Nice. So, yeah, man, it's been a crazy couple of years. I started in 20, when did I start? 2018. And I've been on the go. I've been back to New Zealand twice in five, six years. Wow. Cool. Otherwise, I've just been on the on the go nonstop. Yeah. And then it's been, you're going to do the Cabo and the Mag Bay, the tournament scene um, the mag base a couple trips i assume yeah i don't know the full program on this boat like but i know we're we got like two months two and a half months in um in san jose cabo and then uh i guess uh the captain of the boat said they're probably going to take it back down to costa rica on its own bottom gotcha. so they'll just kind of like tiki tour down the coast um back down to costa rica to capos um and i don't know whether i'll do that or not or come back to hawaii I kind of try not to plan too far ahead in case something cool comes up. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's, uh, I got, I got this carbo thing planned and then no plans after that. So. Awesome, man. Yeah. Here you'll be seeing was, a fair bit of East coast guys there in Cabo this year. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. So, I mean, I, I met a bunch of them down in, in Los Sueños as well. I was, I was living in Los Sueños for the majority of the time. Yeah. It was just so, city I, south. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I call it little America, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, so many great people and some incredible boats as well. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, cool, man. Well, we appreciate the time. Hope, hope you uh, keep on killing it. I mean, that's an incredible story with you and the sailboat. Yeah. yeah I, I mean like the whole reason I, I um, it's funny cause like listening to it, Anthony Shea the other week on your guys' podcast, I was like, we were doing the same thing. Obviously, completely different budgets. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you, I just kind of like achieved the same goal, but on a different budget and a different scale, if you know what I mean. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, yeah it's all some pretty wild places. Yeah. So many people, <laughs> I mean, I know so, so many people that are like, oh, yeah, it must be nice for Anthony, you know, like spending all that millions of dollars and stuff like that. But it's achievable on a different scale for sure. Yeah. That I think that's important for people to know because it is like, you know, if you, if you're thoughtful about it and like you were, you know, it is other things like that are achievable. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I'm excited for, uh, cause An I, I'm assuming Anthony, uh, is going with his other boat. I think the Spencer boat, maybe it's in Australia to the Wong and Ella's after Cairns and that. Uh, they, I think they have a Viking there. Oh, Viking. Sorry. Right yeah. The Spencer, yeah, yeah. Spencer's in Azores. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what their, their South Pacific ambitions were, but I would assume, I mean, similar places that I mean, I'm sure you guys have done similar research. Yeah. Yeah. I actually spoke to Anthony a couple of times briefly about the Wong and Ellis as well. Ah, oh, I would uh, love, <laughs> give anything to go there, dude. Yeah. It's a, it's Jurassic Park for Stripe Mile and for sure. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, that place is, I remember the first time we went there, it was, we struggled to find them because it's a big bank. That's a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize is. You think you just turn up to this tiny little bank. It's uh, it's like 20 miles wide and 60 miles long. Yeah. And so you can quite easily miss them because they're normally extremely bunched up there. Um, it took us like eight hours to find them the first time The first time we went. I could imagine that, you know, because it's like from northern New Zealand, it's like 250 miles, right? Uh, it's like almost four. It's 400 from the port where you have to leave. You have to leave from the east coast. Okay. Um, and it's four, like a hundred up the coast and then 300 from Cape Rianga. Golly. Yeah. So, it's a yeah. long way. Two, it's imagine. like two days, two days. Yeah. Two you days couldn't, out. you couldn't do that in a, like a traditional sport for sure. Like, I mean, you'd have to chug, but like even my boat 64 footer holds two, 2,200 gallons. It would be fucking pushing it to go up there, troll and come back. Like yeah, you'd I mean, have to load, it, load fuel on top of fuel. So, yeah. Yeah. A couple of people have done it in like sport fishing boats. I know a couple of, uh, like 48 footers that have been out there wow. and they just, they just chug and, uh, and take plenty of bladders and, and do that. They've, 
and obviously they get some there's there's been more and more boats starting to go yeah and uh we always have this discussion when we're going and like that boat destiny is such a tank um and we've seen some crazy weather out there like we've had one one wave come right over the top of that boat which wow. was extremely scary um but yeah, we always say it's only a matter of time before an accident happens out there. Yeah, I mean, Someone... it's, a, it's a, yeah, because it seems like, I, I don't know, I did one night I went down a rabbit hole on the internet and it was like, there's, there's just like, it seems like the weather isn't that consistent to make go up there. And it's the Tasman Sea, man. It's, it's brutal out there. Cause it's, it, it's, so you're talking like almost two and a half days to get there. To get there. Yeah. And then you've got to have, yeah. Then typically you when we, typically for... when we plan it, mm-hmm. we, we either choose rough weather on the way out there or rough weather on the way back. You never I get it you. good yeah. all the way. You know, you got to choose one or the other. Yeah. Um, to get the good weather when you're there, you know. Yeah. So it's a crazy place, Jurassic Park. One That's of the awesome. one of the one of the coolest places. I'm excited to go fish Mag Bay and catch some of those little guys. But the only other place I know where you can catch numbers of bigger fish is um, the Galapagos. Mm-hmm. The the bigger striped marlin is the Galapagos. Yeah. And I don't even but, think they, I mean, my but, uncle's been there a couple of times. I don't think they're like the ones there. No, so, no. I, don't, and, I and could I, be wrong, but. but hands down, I reckon, I mean, I caught plenty of blue marlin now. I, I reckon uh, like a 300 pound stripey is like harder to catch than a, I, a 300 pound blue marlin. I would, I definitely think it's a contest because those things are, yeah. I mean, the, the, the few that I've caught in Mag Bay, they've up, up to probably hundred. 20 150 pounds you're just like dude this thing is it's ridiculous how hard this thing pulls if yeah. you don't get yeah, if, yeah. you, if you don't get the leader in a couple in the first five minutes you're you're there for 40 minutes you know on a yeah once they dig in it's yeah. it's brutal but we've caught some really big ones there like dinosaurs yeah that I, I reckon a couple of them i could confidently say close to 500 pounds i could only imagine the dorsal fin on that thing yeah they're big <laughs> <laughs> i've got i actually caught a big one like a 400 pounder when i was back in new zealand and i was in my little my friend's little skiff and i'm holding there's a photo of me holding it off the side of the boat and the dorsal's higher than the gunnels wow and it's like and its mouth's in the water you know it's like yeah. so high but uh all right well yeah it was fun fun being on here yeah hey, man thank you very much what a interesting story and have good good time in Cabo. You'll be meeting a lot of people from. The yeah, are you going Coast down stuff. this year? I don't know. I'd I'd like to, but I don't have any plans at the moment. But I might. The guys from the uh, C student are headed there. They're on my dock right now here in Ocean City, and I'm trying to right. maybe slide on there yeah. or, or get a maybe maybe I can get my guys over there and fish with them for a trip. Right on. So cool, man. All right. Oh, let me know. Well, Hugo McLean, thank you very much. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. This is a state of sport fishing. Um, if you guys, this has provided you any sort of value, please check out the, the Billfish Company website and Hook Optics website. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks. Bye.